ओम नमः शिवाय 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 In conformity with this, the text that has a reading with the fifth case ending, that is to say, the organs do not depart from this one, they merge in this one only, Madhyandina reading, has to be interpreted to mean that though the embodied soul is primarily alluded to by the pronoun this one, still the denial is concerned with the departure from the body that is figuratively identified with the embodied soul. But in the case of those of the Kanvarisension who have the reading of this one, with the sixth case ending, the departure is denied in relation to the man of knowledge, so that the denial in that sentence is concerned with the departure as it is well known in the world. And what is a well known fact is the departure from the body and not from the embodied soul so that the denial comes to mean the denial of the departure of the organs from the body. Moreover, the departure of the ignorant man from the body and his course of transmigration are described elaborately in the text, the soul departs either through the eyes or through the head or through any other part of the body. When it departs, all the organs follow, etc. Brihadaranyaka 4.4.2 that topic of the ignorant man is ended with, Thus does the man transmigrate who desires. Brihadaranyaka 446. Then the man of knowledge is mentioned thus, But the man who does not desire. Ibidum. Now, should the latter text mean that the departure from the body in the earlier text is meant for him as well, then this separate mention becomes incongruous. Hence, to make this separate mention purposeful, the text is to be explained to signify the denial of the departure and the following of a course in the case of a man of knowledge, though they are but natural to a man of ignorance. Besides, it is unreasonable that a man who has known Brahman and become identified with the all-pervasive Brahman and has his desires and results of karma annihilated should depart or have any course to follow for there is no rhyme or reason for that. And texts like, Attains Brahman in this very body, Brihadaranyaka 447, indicate the absence of departure and paths for him. Sutra 14 Smritecha And the Smriti also says so. Moreover, the absence of movement and departure is mentioned in the Mahabharata, even gods become befooled in the course of finding out the path of one who has become one with the self of all beings, who has understood all beings truly as the self, and who has no state to reach. Opponent. But the Smriti also mentions a path that the knowers of Brahman tread. Once upon a time, Shuka, son of Vyasa, became desirous of liberation and proceeded towards the solar orb. When called back by his father who was following him, he responded, saying, Sir, Vedantin, not so, for it is to be understood that Shuka reached a particular reason through his power of yoga even while he was in the body, and there he gave it up. For such facts as being seen by all beings are mentioned in that connection, whereas nobody can have any visual perception when a disembodied soul moves on. It is in line with this, that in that very context the conclusion is made thus, but Shuka accelerated his speed to more than that of wind, moved across space, exhibiting his own power, and then he became merged in all beings. Hence, the knower of Brahman has neither any departure from the body, nor any course to follow. We shall state later on as to whom the Upanishadic texts about courses refer. Sutra 437 Namaste So, this is the second part of the argument 
that was begun in the Adhikarna about the separation of the organs from the pure being. Now, the reason this is so complicated is that the misunderstanding, the opponent's misunderstanding, is based on simply a misinterpretation of a few lines in the Upanishads. See, this is what happens. People want to make a point, and so they focus on the context that supports that point, ignoring the majority of the context, which doesn't. <laughs> so they get all hung up on the, the turn of a single word, huh? a single case ending even, and try to prove their point just to be different from, you know, the prevailing view or the classical view. Um, one of our viewers made this point that modernists, people who want to reform, you know, the ancient traditions, uh, they do this all the time. They try to narrow down the point of view or the background or the context in a kind of tunnel vision, you know, to only those texts or those arguments that prove their points. And they ignore, you know, like the whole thing, right? So the whole background in this case is the story of how the soul leaves the body at death. And what is that? Well, it depends on whether that being is enlightened or not enlightened. And of the enlightened, whether they have realized the conditioned Brahman, Brahman with qualities, Saguna Brahman, or the higher Brahman, or the original Brahman without qualities, Nirguna Brahman. So in the case of the unenlightened being, and the relatively enlightened being, they have a path. They go somewhere. They take their mind and not the physical organs, but the subtle organs, the mental functions of the organs, such as sight, sound, and so forth. And then they go along a path after death to a new body, a new destination. In the sense of the unenlightened person, it's that they're going to the moon and they're going to experience pleasure and pain according to the proportion of their previous activities, the nature of their karma and their degree of consciousness of enlightenment. And then they come back again to the earth to labor for a higher perfection. Whereas those who have realized the conditioned Brahman, the qualitative Brahman, go to the sun planet and then beyond the sun planet to the higher planets that are not subject to dissolution at the end of the Kalpa. So in both cases, the subtle body accompanies the soul. In fact, serves as a vehicle, a platform for the soul to make this journey along this path, leading either to the moon or to the sun, and either to rebirth or to a relative liberation, Shankara calls it, in the higher planets. And from there, they go to absolute liberation. Whereas a few rare souls attain absolute liberation right here in the body itself. And they don't go anywhere. They don't have any path. And they don't take the organs with them. The organs remain in the body. And the whole thing just dissolves. So that's the story we have to get straight. Huh? That's my story and I'm sticking to it.
<laughs> that is the story of the scriptures. That is what is stated again and again, not only in the Upanishads, but even in the Smritis. The Smritis are like the Puranas, the Itihasas, the Tantras, etc. So what we have to learn from this is that the point of view of the enlightened being, of the practitioner, of the realized one, is always going to be superior to the analysts and the logicians and the philosophers and the academics who are not realized. And you have to see this tendency in all spiritual cultures to sideline the practitioners and institute a philosophy, a doctrine, a dogma, based on some isolated contexts in the scriptures. Well, why do they do this? Well, because they want power. They want influence. They want to establish that this is the teaching. Huh? And it's, of course, an interpretation that benefits them. It makes it possible for them to keep control of the organization around the teaching, the religious institution that propagates the teaching. So we strongly disagree with this. We take a very hard position against it. Yes, religious and spiritual institutions have to exist to propagate the teachings, publish the teachings, uh, distribute them among the people, and even give beginning instructions in the philosophy and so on, the practices. But where they err is when they drop their support for the practices, by example, because the leaders don't do them. What do they do? Well, they administer the organization. They're politicians. Their administrators, drones, uh, materialists in the guise of spiritual teachers. Nowadays, it's become a big business. When you go to India and in any temple you go to, you know, the first thing you're going to do is hit you up for a donation. Well, maybe they flatter you a little bit first, <laughs> but it's inevitable. You know it's coming. <laughs> You know, there's an opportunity to support this wonderful organization that's doing so much good. And they have elaborate websites showing all their charity activities and the beautiful temples they've built and the so many disciples learning, you know, all this stuff. And what are they learning? Not the original teaching, that's for sure. And not the practices either. They're learning to go out and collect money. That's my experience in every single spiritual organization I have ever been involved in. And I've been involved in quite a few of them. Even big famous ones. And really the bottom line is it's all about the money. I'll give you a really ironic example. When my Adi Guru was with us, he approved a set of aphorisms that supposedly came from some Chinese teaching. And the four aphorisms were, books are the basis. No problem, right? Got to have those books. Preaching is the essence. Purity is the force. And utility is the principle. In other words, you want this teaching to be a success, publish a bunch of books, be pure in your practices and lifestyle, right? And teach others, base your whole life on teaching. And whatever is practical should be the basis of what you're doing. Well, over time, this got changed to bucks are the basis, 
Purity is a farce. Preaching is a nuisance. And futility is the principle. This is the influence of mundane administrators in the posts of spiritual teachers. They have the designations, they have the organizational position and power, but what they don't have is the results of the practice because they're too busy doing business to do the practice. So you have to be very careful to weed out these personalities and not to hear from them. You know, that's why I don't watch other YouTube channels. I don't listen to other teachers on Advaita because almost all of them are either officers of big spiritual organizations or they are affiliated with big organizations and, you know, teaching their dogma, their line. And if you compare with the original scriptures, you'll always find discrepancies. Why? They don't want you to attain liberation. They don't want you to be enlightened because then you will not support them financially. Bottom line. So be very careful who you hear from. Authentic renunciants actual practitioners and deep students of the entire range of the literature, not just some narrow portion that justifies their beliefs. Okay, that's today's lesson. Aung Tat Sat, Aung Shakti Aung, Aung Namah Shiva.